So Mark, yes, thank you choir, y'all do a fantastic job, but I don't know if you were listening to what I was listening to, like, let's just make this the choir. Y'all did great, thank you so much. It was great to stop for a while and just together, praise God. Uh, today, we're going to be in Psalm 30, or Psalm 30, in the summer of Psalms is where we're going to be, and uh, I don't know if you had a grandfather like I had. I had two of them like this, that nothing was ever truly broken beyond repair. Ah, uh, and I mean that, right? Nothing was ever like just broken and to the point where you say, well, I'm done with that and you can discard it. Yet we, we live in a time where it seems so easy to discard and then replace instead of repair, and as we look at this text today, uh, we're joining in the Psalms that sing of God's work among His people about one that really sings about God's repair work on a heart. Now, I know how it goes, and I'm going to let you in on something, right? When, when we're sick or injured, we want prayer. Church prayer lists are called, or uh, folks are asked to pray when someone's facing a health concern or anything like that, right? That's, that's the way it can be, uh, so much so, and I mean no disrespect here, but I remember hearing uh, one preacher a long time ago when I was young, we talked about uh, like the prayer list there, and he says, yes, our prayer list sounds like an organ recital. Come think about it. It's kind of a little bit, I think, but all the different parts of the body that can ail and need prayer for that. And so we can uh, list those things that are broken, but, but when it really comes down to it, what we really realize and pray for is the great miracle that occurs when those who are rejuvenated and recovered and redeemed celebrate what God has done in their lives. Because we can celebrate healing that's there, and the psalmist that we'll look at uh, today uh, reminds us of that, uh, that when we're in those down times of life, we pray for recovery. If you've never lived, if you haven't lived long enough, you will soon enough to pray and to cry out for God in a time of physical distress. Uh, for me, it happened when I was seven years old when I got hit by a car. I remember, vivid, remember vividly the, the feeling of being struck and lying in the gutter and carried to the hospital and laying on a gurney and going through all the tests and watching the doctors and my parents wring their hands and going through that recovery process with multiple injuries. Um, and so, kids, don't play in the street. <laughs> but my life has been a series of those events, of waking up, it seems like, in hospitals, uh, wondering if I would. I remember seven years ago, waking up after repair to a congenital heart uh, valve defect that finally had given out, and the doctors had stitched it and put it all back together. And I remember uh, praying and having faith going into the surgery, well, if I wake up here, great. If I wake up and see Jesus, great. And uh, as I woke up there in the uh, recovery area, uh, still, you know, kind of intubated, Kelly had turned uh, my face to where I'd be looking right at her when I woke up. But somehow, right when I woke up, I turned and I looked over to the other side of the bed. And there was a pastor who had mentored me, a guy named Paul Powell. Some of you know him. And he was standing there beside the bed. I think he had on a white shirt. It just felt like he did. And so, he, there he was. That's kind of bad pastoral form for him to do that. He was all dressed in white. And I remember seeing Paul as I woke up from surgery. And the first thought in my mind was, is Paul still alive? <laughs> and I remember he is. And I thought, okay, well, this is good. This is a good thing. And I turned over and I saw Kelly. So if you've not been in one of those times of life, you will be if you haven't already and you, you can kind of identify with the personal, uh, com the personal and plaintive work of the psalmist here in this prayer. But one of the things that it reminds us to do, for this is a psalm that it says maybe in your some of the headings that were added there, this is a psalm used at the dedication of the temple. And you're thinking, a psalm about praying from being sick is a psalm that you would 
sing at the dedication of a building intended for the worship of the Most High God. But if you think about it, those who know they are broken and are in need of a healer are those who often worship the best when they receive recovery, rejuvenation, restoration, and a call to praise God. And so uh, that's the thing here. This is a psalm that reminds us that Those who are full-time worshipers and disciples of Jesus Christ are aware that God is a full-time healer and helper in their lives. Those who are part-time servants are quite brash to expect a full-time Lord. Consider that. Let's bow together in prayer. God, as we look at the text before us, we are mindful of, that you heal. God, we, we have plenty of stories of it happening. We have times we know when it, when it doesn't, but we know that our souls are healed and rejuvenated and restored through Jesus Christ's gift of grace. And so in his name I pray for your spirit to do the greatest work of healing in this room among those who need to be saved now. Oh, Lord, that's all of us. And we all said, amen. When was the last time you prayed for a miracle? I mean, really, when was the last time you prayed for something miraculous uh, to happen uh, in the world and in your life around you? Uh, Look at this psalm there and, and look at what it says after one who had prayed and received recovery from an illness, but yet, again, a song used in worship of God and a gathering of believers. Uh, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Uh, Sing the praises of the Lord. You, his faithful people, praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm, but when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. Have you been there? I mean, have you been there? Have you been in that deepest, darkest pit, ashen, sackcloth wearing, wailing, weeping moment of life and received the restorative work of God in your life, not just physically, but spiritually? And then when it is done and recovered, do you find yourself stepping out and walking probably just about that far above the ground? Have you been there? I'm trying to look. Somebody raise a hand. Somebody get with me. Have you been there? Do you know what that feels like? That is the one thing we can carry in contagiousness to others around us that need to hear that. For we find in this text today that it is this God that always transforms suffering into glory that takes sackcloth and turns it into royal robes and takes limping feet and turns them into nimble dance steps. 
and turn silent tongues into amplified joy. We often are too quiet in our joy of God's work among us, wondering and fearing what someone might think. But it was not the case, for even in this psalm, it gives a reference back to David's awareness of joy when the the Ark of the Covenant is moved to his heart house to God's place and David dances and leaps before it right Michael she she looks at him and says oh you've dishonored yourself and he says oh no I will be more ludicrous I will be more abandoned I'll be more foolish than this before God I don't care what anybody thinks For if they see me truly praising God for what God has truly done, then they will truly be called to praise God as well. And so when we are ready to be aware that God is working in our lives, we remember, like my grandfather, there is nothing and no person broken beyond repair. I I inherited a lot of the tools that didn't get discarded. And you know what? They'll probably be used by my grandkids. And some of you are going, yeah, it's because they just don't make things like they used to. And you're right. But maybe we don't take care like we used to. So uh, look at this with me and, and think, because you've heard me say it. I mean, now is the time when... What people think Christians are like needs to be replaced by accurately what followers of Jesus Christ, Christians are in the world today, right? I mean, again, we can celebrate Supreme Court rulings, and that's fine. I'm I'm with you. My whole lifetime, all I've known is this conversation in the legal and the political world. That's all I've been aware of. And For me, I can tell you, I I believe, and you all know this, that here we are as followers of Christ. We believe life is precious. Life's potential is precious. Life's daily living of it is precious. All the way through to its last breath is precious. And so that's that's great for us. I'm I'm glad for that. Are, Are you not glad for that? But it opens up a whole new thing that I'll talk about in a bit longer because really, Our worship is not focused on legislative rulings, but upon the victory of Jesus Christ in each individual heart. I mean, that's really where this victory happens. So, again, a lot of things may describe what Christians are like, but let's go for accuracy here. And I've been with you a while. I've been watching. These are things you all do. You're going to say, oh, no, the the humble ones around you are the ones who are probably doing it the most. But he says here that this worship among God's people, those who have received the healing and the recovery and the rejuvenation that he gives, worship is practiced and perfected by servants, not by lords, Not by those who uh, feel they can walk around having earned it, but those who humbly praise the one that's in charge of everything about their lives. Those are the ones who practice it and perfect it. Now, again, a while ago, I I talked about that that moment in life when we probably received something in our lives that was just fantastic, where God gave a moment of, of deliverance for us, and we felt elated in our praise. But, but here's the thing. Our, our spontaneity in worship is good. Being able to move to worship as a result or reaction to God working in our life is good, but consistent faithfulness and praise of the Most High God, better. I mean, we can be worshiping Him all the time. Every hour, every day, every breath, every moment, in, out, every part of our life is worship of God. The question is, are we getting better at it? Are we practicing it? I mean, think about the athlete or the musician 
or, or the, the, the student. I mean, all of those abilities that they're going to achieve get better with repetition, with practice, right? Nobody shows up on the field of athletic endeavor, just kind of walks on and goes, I think we've got this figured out. No, they've learned the plays. They've learned how to make that happen. Thankfully, and I know you all think this happens, but, but you know the, the worship that happens here, those people that play the instruments and sing, they've practiced. Not because they're trying to impress you, but they want to bring a good sacrifice of praise to God the audience of one in front of whom we've gathered. So again, that's it for us as well. Our worship is an activity that's improved by your participation, not by your spectatorship. Now, it's been said, if you take all the Christians that were in church on Sunday and laid them out end to end, they'd be more comfortable I can cite any numerous statistic for you. And we could sit here and bemoan about the percentage of people that call themselves Christians that rarely or occasionally gather with others for worship of the Most High God. But that's not the point. They're not here. You are. And I want to tell you, it's not about coming routinely and ritually so that you are numbed to the experience of worship of the Most High God. It is about pouring yourself into it time and a time again, like the runner that runs a little bit further, one step further, one second faster, so that the next time they run, they can run further and faster. It is about being aware of being able to worship in that moment, worship isn't something that you go and and when you feel like worshiping. Worshiping is something you do until you realize you're feeling like worshiping God. And I'm not talking about just for an hour on Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here. Like I said, this isn't for those that that don't come. We're we're here. I want to encourage you. Man, Pour the same intensity and intentionality into finding ways to be in worship of the Most High God as you go throughout your week. I mean, you know, sometimes you can wake up on some days, and and I get it. I'm getting to that stage where stuff kind of aches, and you get out of bed, and you go, oh, oh, good Lord, it's morning. But really, shouldn't we start out every day with, good Lord, it's morning. And through the reading of Scripture and prayer and conversation, our our celebration of what God has done in our lives has happened Monday through Saturday so that when we arrive on a Sunday morning, we don't have to, like, find a gear to get on down the road of worship. We've already gotten started. And then we just share that moment of praise together. It's not an evaluation of how good the songs are or the sermon is or the lighting is or whether both screens work or all those kind of things that that happen. Bulbs coming this week, Mark wants you to know. It's not about that. I mean, we could worship, well, probably a lot more of you wouldn't come. We could worship outside under a tree if we all were worshiping every day of the week. This is worship gathered. In a while, you walk out in worship scattered. So I'd say practice at it. So when we come back next week, you're already ahead of the game, man. You're, you're already like, you've already hunted through the gears and you're rolling and other people around you are trying to catch up because you're praising God for who he is and what he's done. So again, Worship is practiced and perfected by those who are already serving the Lord. Wholeness in our life is generous and it is given by God. It's so easy to think that the stability in life comes by our own hand, but the psalmist says, I thought everything was going good for me. It's kind of like that story of Job that illustrates it so well, right? That book right before this one that says, hey, the rug can come out from under anyone's life anytime. It can. And the question is, do you Realize every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above or by your ability. 
this uh, last week, we had the opportunity to go on family vacation. And I put vacation in quotes because like, I was still the dad and the grandfather. and It seemed a little like work at times. But we took one day and we went to a place I had not been for a long time, uh, to Silver Dollar City up there. Have you ever been there? It's kind of a quaint place, and the rides are fun. It's great for the kids. Had had a good time. Uh, Rode some roller coasters that, like, straightened or broke me. I'm not sure which. But the neat thing was, was going into uh, the pottery shop. And I went in there, and I looked, and because I always like to buy a coffee mug where I get, because I want to buy a big one, because one of the things about if you ever have stuff done on your heart, they say you can only have one cup of coffee a day, so I like to buy a big one. And I found one that was nice and it was uniquely made. And the the kind man working in the shop said, that that mug was made right there. And he pointed to the pottery wheel in the shop. The craftsman wasn't there at the time, but he said, said, hey, flip it up. Look on the bottom. And he said, look there on the bottom of it. And I said, yeah. And it said stamped, you know, Silver Dollar City. He said, look right beside it. And there just not huge, not brash, was a tiny little stroke of a stylus, like a tiny autograph. And he said, that means that the maker approved it. He put his stamp on it. He said, this one's good. And I said, I'll take it. Good salesmanship. No, seriously, it was, uh, I bought it and I'm glad to have it. But again, we, we remember that mark is on him. But here's the thing. If we're in Christ, everything generous given by God about us is his mark upon us. And I'm not, not just our health, not prosperity, but everything about us, every unique individual aspect about you. Because the neat thing about that mug, the way that it was made, there's not another one just like it. It didn't come down an assembly line. It's got some little bumps in it. It's, the glazing's got some kind of streaks and the colors that are kind of blended together. The value of life, and I speak this in terms of where we are today in the new cycle of the week and our awareness of it, but here's what we need to speak into this. The value of life isn't just at its forming in the womb. Oh, it's there. But through God's hand, on the shaping of an entire life. You were precious before you were born, and you are precious today. For the potter that spins the wheel and then takes the piece of clay and then may reshape it or refashion it or press it down and turn it into something else is the same hand that's upon your life Every bump, every dent, every discoloration, everything there in your life that is happening by the hand of God upon you is you're aware of this because you're worshiping all the time. You're aware that God's working on you. You're aware that God is moving through you. You're surrounded by him. You're filled with his spirit. You're in his word. You're saved by Christ. You're covered by all of that. And as you're living, you will find right there, and I'm not asking Somebody, I, I know this because I was like a youth worker for a while. Somebody's going like, oh, he's going to tell us to look on our bottom and see if there's a stamp. No, I'm not asking you to do that. But that mark of God is on you. And he says, yeah, this one's good. Remember that. And then last here is this. Our, our witness is... Um, is personal. It really is. I mean, only you uniquely have this witness. And and I mean this sphere of people that you can give witness to, but the story of your life, and that is there. But it's also presented by all of us, the church, you know? All of us together are a part of that. Now, I noticed in that shop, they, they had all of a lot of variety, I mean a lot of variety of, of pottery, all kinds of things from bowls to coffee cups to plates, all, of, all kinds of things that were there. But I noticed they were all doing their job well on display. They weren't junk. They weren't halfway doing it. They were all presenting themselves out to say, 
hey, I'm good for ice cream, I'm good for a cup of coffee and something in between. All those things that were there were on display and present. And we need to remember that because we have this opportunity to be a part of praising God while we have breath. That's what the psalmist said. He says, I'm not going to be able to praise you, God, if I'm in the grave, but while I've got breath, I will praise you. While I'm able to speak, I will tell of you. And so when we have this awareness that the job of God in our lives isn't finished yet, the opportunity for how we express our value for life now, we celebrate and we share that amongst one another. Uh, another. Our, our personal and our gathered worship together is evidence that we have made a commitment to the sacrifice of praise. That matters. Mark expressed appreciation for your giving. I, I'm going to tell you, I know, I know these are the times when it's very tough. I mean, financial times like this, but I want to tell you how, and this is not me, I'm not just making an appeal for the, the sake of funding, but I want to let you know what, what Christians do with their money out of obedience to God in the tightest times speaks louder than many other things they will ever do. And I would encourage you not to scale back faithful generosity for the kingdom work of God. Not just so we can have programs here or keep the air conditioning at 68 instead of 90. I'm, I'm not, not that. It's not for that. I'm, I'm, that's the... That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about for the sake of the kingdom of God. Don't, don't pull back now. I mean, don't give up on the faithfulness of God to provide. Don't, don't think it's about your astute bookkeeping that needs to happen. Don't make it depend upon you. The, didn't say that, look, I, I can figure this out, God. Just please continue in your faithfulness for the sake of the kingdom because I can tell you the days are coming when more and more what we do in response to the opportunities to speak into a broken yet repairable world, the redemption and the restoration that can happen there, just like my grandfathers didn't throw away the tool, God hasn't thrown this away yet. What's in front of us means that all the things that we have the opportunity to participate in matter. I've always kind of talked about it. Can you imagine if every Christian, everyone that called themselves a Christian, engaged in their local congregation, really, really tithed? We would not have any fear of how to support and speak into the issues of crisis pregnancies in the days to come. Or to care for parenting that needs to happen, or provide for solid mentoring for young couples in their homes, to uh, help those in foster and adoption situations, to really be a part of building up Bible study and Sunday school and all of those things that we could do. We, we wouldn't be sitting there trying to figure out how to, how to make a little bit go a long way, but we'd like, whoa, there's more than we know what to do with. So I would encourage you, that kind of faithfulness, can you imagine what that would speak in worship? More than mighty buildings or popular authors. The worship and the witness and the wholeness of individual believers in Jesus Christ, that's what's going to carry salvation to the world. You see... Part-time servants are brash to expect a full-time Lord, but those who are full-time worshipers and disciples of Christ are aware that God is a full-time healer and helper to every part of their life. So my hope today going into this was that I wasn't, I wasn't trying to say that you've had to have some kind of near-death experience in order to get this psalm. I hope that you don't feel like you have to have that moment. I, my, my fear, my, my, excuse me, my hope would be that you would realize every breath that you have, every breath of that one next to you is a gift from God. Every touch, every sight, every taste is amazing. Every moment is a present. Every tongue that confesses Jesus Christ is Lord is a miracle and worthy of praise. Would you stand with me as we pray?
Father, today in this room, there are those who need to say publicly, Jesus has made me whole. I believe he is the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins. You raised him from the dead, and he is Lord. God, today for those who need to say, I want to follow Jesus, let him respond. For those who say, Lord, I'm praying about a body of believers who who worship and witness uh, to the whole work of God in their lives, and if they're looking for a church home, God, let it be today that we can begin to talk about that with them. Lord, we pray that today you would carry us out from here into a world that needs to see us worshiping beyond the parking lot. In Jesus' name I pray. We all said, Amen.